During the last few weeks, we've discovered that Habakkuk, even though referred to as a minor prophet, isn't called minor because of its impact, but because of its size. It's only three chapters long. So would you turn to Habakkuk chapter 3? We'll read verses 1 through 4. I may have made a mistake on what I sent to media. I just realized that if I took it off here. It's actually Habakkuk chapter... Well, well, let's see. I think it's chapter 3. Anyway, just, just follow along. This short little book offers us so many great practical truths that are so relevant for our day. We described his bad attitude in chapter 1, his uh, unanswered questions, uh, unheard prayers, unseen responses, and it all led to a prophet's unfair conclusions. And you know, we can all get there. We can come to these unfair conclusions when we don't feel our prayers are being answered fast enough or we have unanswered questions. Last week, we talked about the need for a big adjustment. First week was bad attitude. Last week, big adjustment. We discovered from chapter 2 that Habakkuk's attitude determined his altitude. It's interesting that he wanted to get a little higher, and his attitude determined his altitude. And he says, I will change my posture. I'm going to get higher. I'm going to change my position. I'm going to change and pursue God with a different attitude. So today, we'll describe the prophet's bold action. I will respect his word. I will rest and wait. I'll rely on the Lord and I'll rejoice in the Lord. And another way of unpacking Habakkuk is to understand that in chapter 1, the prophet wonders, wonders, God, what are you up to? Why are you not hearing me? Why are you not answering our prayers? He wonders. You see, the first part of chapter 1 is really indicative of the whole nation's bad attitude. God wants to deal with us individually, but sometimes the nation itself can have a bad attitude. They are stiff-necked and rebellious, and it's bringing judgment upon themselves, and the prophet's attitude toward God is no different than the people's. Habakkuk, knowing the hard-heartedness of his countrymen, wonders, how long can this intolerable condition be tolerated by our God, who says he loves us? And yet he's allowing all of this to happen. Remember that Habakkuk ministers during Judah's throes, through repeatedly called to repentance, The nation stubbornly refuses to change her sinful ways. God can put out words, words like today. God can put out words, and people will resist. And sometimes the Lord applies a pressure, I believe that, in order to get our attention. Does anybody believe that? Does anybody believe that? We need to, because he loves us that much. Um. So he wonders how long, and because of the Lord's unbelievable promise made in chapter 1, verse 5, it's an unbelievable promise. I'm going to raise up these Chaldeans. What a promise, but they're going to come in and stomp you. They're going to beat you down. It won't matter how much you pray. It won't matter how much you fast. It won't matter what you do. This is going to happen. It's not a prophecy that preachers would want to preach. It's not a prophecy that most people would receive, but it happened. So as we start chapter 2, the prophet decides to wait. He moves from wondering to waiting. If you got a word like that, you might want to wait too. And he waits. In chapter 1, he wonders. In chapter 2, he waits. And who knows? Perhaps that is where we are today. Perhaps we have a perspective, a position, and a posture that needs to be adjusted It needs to be adjusted. And the Lord is saying, you don't have it right. Your attitude's bad. It needs adjusted. But when we get to chapter 3, there's another shift. The prophet worships. Worships. He moves from a bad attitude and takes some bold action and begins to worship. So let's observe some bold action taken by the prophet in chapter 3. The scripture is on the screen, and I want to I read that right now. And um, I thought maybe that was Stella, so I was really concerned. But I'm concerned about any baby. I hope, I hope everything's good. So praise the Lord. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm reminded of the little story of the little kid that got in trouble, and he was screaming all the way out. And as he got to the back door, he collared for everybody to pray for him. You ever heard that? <laughs> My mama took me out. I'd hope people were praying, I tell you. (laughs) Verses 1 and 2. A prayer of Habakkuk, 
the prophet, on Shigenoth, O Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Uh, when I heard my body, what? Trembled. My, my lips quivered at the voice. You know, I find this very interesting what happens when God's people got in the presence of God. It, it, it wasn't helicopter twirls. It wasn't always, uh, whoo. Most of the time, the deep reverence and awe of God grabbed them, and they became desperate. I learned a lot from our Slavic people in Denver that we pastored for a number of years. We had a Slavic ministry there as well, and it was so exciting to watch that work grow. And I used to watch the difference between our American church and the Slavic church. In my church, people danced and fell back almost every service in my American English-speaking church. In the Slavic church, they fell forward every service. And they would fall on their face in reverence to God. Do you see the difference? It's not wrong to celebrate, of course, and it's not wrong to celebrate the presence of God. There's passages like that, but I would suggest to you that perhaps a little more falling forward in understanding the reverence and awe of God's presence. Ginger was all over it in just a few moments ago. The awe of God, the reverence, the holy moments are special. There's a time to stand still or to be still and to let the Lord move and speak and whisper. Does that make sense? Can we give him praise that he whispers and he works in that stillness and that awe? It's an awesome thing. Um, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones as I trembled in myself that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his Troops, these evil, bad people will become the Lord's troops. Look at verses 16 through 19. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice in the Lord I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, not the cow in the barn, not my financial security. None of that's my security. The Lord is, the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and he will make me walk on the high hills. I'm going to a higher place. I'm going to a higher place to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. What is he saying here? He says, I'm going to do six things. What do you do when you're stuck? What should we be doing right now as a nation when we are uncomfortable and uneasy? Maybe you're not, and that's okay. More power to you. I know a lot of people that are. They're uncomfortable. There's an uneasiness. What do you do? What do you do in your personal life when you feel stuck and it feels like you know God is with you, but you're just, it's just not happening the way you've envisioned it or the way you want it to happen. I think there's six things that we can look at here, and I, I, I've laid these out differently than I've ever thought of it before as far as speaking on Habakkuk. I've done this before years ago, but, but I've never quite seen it this way. And the first thing he says I will do, I will restore good communication. I will restore good communication. Have you thought about that? If you don't like where you're at in life, if you don't like what you're going through, if you don't like where you're at, if you feel like you need movement in your life, are you willing to restore some good communication with the Lord? Are you happy with your communication with the Lord? Do you talk to him? Do you talk to him only in crisis? Or do you have an ongoing talking relationship with God? You say you can talk to God? Yes, you can talk to God. How many know you can talk to God? That's what prayer is. He says, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. I have heard your speech. Verse 1 says, or verse 1 and 2a. I have heard your speech. I heard you, Lord. And I was afraid. I was afraid, O oh Lord. I, and there's two things he did here. I listened. I have heard. 
You can't hear if you haven't listened. He says, I've listened and I learned. How do you know he learned? Because he said, I was afraid. I listened to what you said. I listened to your voice and I became afraid. You see, prayer is simply communication with God. It's having a conversation with God. And sometimes, as was the case with Habakkuk in chapter one, we want to do all the talking. We want to do the talking. Oh, back at one, he wasn't listening. He was doing all the talking. Where are you? Why is this continuing to happen? I put up this prayer. I wrote down this request. I've done this and I've done that. The people are crying out to you and you're not doing a thing. He wanted to do all the talking. How often have we done that in our prayer lives? We come up with our prayer list. Can you imagine this, having a relationship with somebody and, and every time you sit down with them, they give you a list of what they want from you? Every time they sit down with you, they tell you they want some money. Every time they sit down with you, they want you to do something in their power, in your power to help them. Every time. Lord, will you uh, get me some influence? Lord, will you open a door with this person so I can get next to them, so I can get something done? Let me ask you, what kind of relationship is that? You bring your list. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a prayer list. People love prayer lists and prayer journals and all of that's okay. But you know what? Sometimes I think God gets sick of that if that's all your prayer life is. I'm going to be very candid with you. The Lord wants communication with you. He wants conversation with you. He wants you to be still at times and learn to listen. You say, well, I haven't learned to listen. Well, you didn't learn to listen in school either, many of you. You need to learn to listen. Sit still. Shut everything down. Perhaps you've got too many other voices that are in your head that are drowning out the whispers of the Lord. He wants to speak to you. How many can say in this room, and I want you to be bold about it, unequivocally, I know, I know at least once, twice, or many, many, many of you more than that. I know the Lord has spoke to me. Would you raise your hand right now? Now, would you look at that? Look at the witnesses around this place. Let's give him praise that he speaks and he does that. He does that. So Habakkuk, out of that fear that came from a conversation, some of you don't want a daddy like that, says, if you don't change your attitude, I'm going to fix you. I'm thankful for that kind of daddy. So Habakkuk, out of fear, that came from a conversation that says, you and my people are about to experience a chastisement like none you've seen in your lifetime. You, know, you think you've had it bad. It's about to get worse. I have heard your speech and I was afraid, he says. Um... I like the way he says, I was afraid, oh Lord. His whole narrative changes in this conversation with God. He moves from complaining and condemning to complete compliance. And that is what the Lord wants out of you and I. A surrender. You say, I don't, why do I got to surrender? Well, because he made you. You wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the creator designing you. You wouldn't have breath in your body if it wasn't for the creator. And he wants your heart. He wants you to love him. He wants you to come after him. He wants you to have relationship with him. And communication is one of those ways. And Habakkuk does just that. I will restore good communication. If I was to put this in a summary, in the, in the first of chapter two as well, alludes to it. I'm going to get higher where I can hear, where I can talk with you. I will restore good Communication. Do you have good communication? Secondly, I will respect his word. Look at verse 2a and 16 of chapter 3. O Lord, I've heard your speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. And in your wrath, please remember mercy. That's probably a good thing to pray, huh? Listen to verse 16 again. When I heard, my belly trembled. My lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself. Is there any respect for God's word anymore? When God says, 
People who practice certain sins will not enter the kingdom of God. Is there any respect for that? Is there any respect for God's word when he teaches us, yes, that God is a God of grace and mercy and love, but he's also a God of judgment? The wages of sin is death, and that he's an all-consuming fire. I'm alluding to New Testament passages, by the way, for you that don't like the old. Is there any respect for God's word anymore? I would advocate that the lack of respect for God's word comes from our refusal to take God seriously. We're not taking God seriously anymore. I remember my mother, I've shared stories about my parents and hopefully they know most of them are good, but my mom would get aggravated with my dad at times because she was the disciplinarian. She was feisty. And when we got to be teenagers and begin to think that we didn't have to listen quite as much, I remember, I remember this one particular time, and I remember it happening more than once, but this one time I was in the living room, and we were carrying on. I think my sister was there, and we were making her very nervous because of our loudness and carrying on and tussling. And my dad was sitting in the same room, and we were probably arguing, and my dad was sitting there acting like none of it bothered him a bit. My mother was in the kitchen and she kept saying, calling my dad's name out, Earl, would you deal with that? We just kept on going. Earl, do you hear me? Would you deal with that? And we just kept on going. And I'll never forget her coming with a big, it was something you beat the food with. I don't remember what it was called. It was about that long, and she came into the doorway, and she said, Earl, if you don't deal with that, I'm coming in here, and I'm going to start swinging, and I'm not going to stop. And I remember my dad looking at her. He was caught up in the newspaper, whatever he was doing, and he turned to us, and he said, hey, you're making your mother nervous. Would you settle down? And that made her real mad. (laughs) He paid a price for that. Authority can get frustrated when instructions are ignored and their words are not being taken seriously. It really can be due due to a lack of respect. I don't know about you, but I want to respect the word of the Lord again. I don't only want to respect his loving, gracious, tender words like we talked about a few weeks ago. His mercy is new every morning. Oh, I love that. I wish that's all I was required to preach on every week because I sure love that. But I also want to respect his words when he's serious and he's saying, stop it. When he's saying, stop it to communities. When he's saying, stop it to his church. When he's saying, adjust your position, my word says this. When we want to uh, find ways around his word and excuse ourselves from his word as if it doesn't apply to me, but maybe applies to somebody else. Or maybe it was for back then and not today. Have you ever heard that nonsense? As if the word is irrelevant today, except for those things that I pick and choose. And if I don't like what it says, I'll come up with a new hermeneutic to try to reinvent some interpretation skills so that I can explain my way around this and live and do what I want to do. Don't tell me that's not the day in which we live. That is the day in which we live. And we've got to call it out. We've got to speak to it because we've got kids that are being raised in all of this. And they're getting inundated with it. And they're Googling it. And they're hearing all of these new ways, more intelligent ways. But I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, the Word of God is true. It was true yesterday, and it's true today. It was true hundreds of years ago, and it's just as true today. It'll be true tomorrow. It's eternal. It will always be true. Thanks be unto God for His great Word that is still truth today. Can we celebrate that today? He's good. He's good. He's good. When you're stuck, thirdly, I'll remember God's faithfulness. The prophet reviews the history of Israel and the wonderful works of the Lord. We didn't read it in verses 3 through 16 of this chapter. He begins to review the history of Israel. This poetic description of God's mighty power does not seem to follow any special pattern, nor does it cover all the main events in Jewish history. But Habakkuk knew that God had worked in the past, and therefore he could trust him to work in the present and in the future. 
When we struggle with waiting on God's response or we struggle with waiting like Habakkuk, I think it's necessary that we go back and review our personal history. Our personal history. Hebrews says this, Hebrews 13, 8. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Did you get that? The Hebrew writer made it very clear. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same in our personal history. Yesterday, today, and forever. What does that mean? In your personal life, what he did for you yesterday, what he brought you through yesterday, his faithfulness yesterday can be counted on today. And what he did yesterday, he not only is able to do today, but he's able to see you through tomorrow. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Could we just celebrate that today that he's brought us through some things? Absolutely. It's the same with our church history, our nation's history. I saw this post this week, and it, and it made sense. It's funny how the narrative can constantly change. And I want to be cautious here, and I want to pad what I'm about to say by saying I respect this virus. If anybody ought to respect it, I ought to. I know it's real, but I've also recognized some things. In six months, we've gone from the vax ending the pandemic, to you can still get COVID even if vaxxed, to you can pass COVID on to others even if vaxxed, to you can still die of COVID even if vaxxed, to the unvaxxed are killing the vaxxed. That's the truth. I'm not making light of COVID. Don't you dare think that. And don't you judge me for that. I know my heart. I'm not making light of it. What I am telling you is before your eyes. Shifts, 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 shifts. Well, they didn't know. How long does this have to be around before we know some things? It is constantly shifting. Now, if you want to walk in fear with all of that, have at it. I'm not. I'm not walking in fear anymore to that. I'm done. I'm done. I'll respect it. To the vulnerable, please be careful. If you're vulnerable, be careful and don't impose it on everybody else. I'd rather go through it and have it again than live a life of fear for the next few years. You're saying, Pastor, you're crazy. No, I'm not crazy. Look at the numbers for Pete's sake. Look at the numbers. Look at what it says. We got to start getting some common sense with all of this and stop living in fear every time we turn around. Let's be smart. Let's be careful, but we can still move forward by the grace of God and live the lives that God has called us to live in this day in which we live. I know you get tired of hearing me saying it, but I don't need your emails. I don't need your text. I don't need your angry comments. I'm not saying don't wear a mask. For Pete's sake, wear a mask. If you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. And we shouldn't make fun of somebody that wants to wear a mask. Quit. Stop the peer pressure. Stop cowing the peer pressure on both sides. You do what you're supposed to do and live your life and live it in the fear and abdomen of the Lord and be careful, be conscious, be aware, but let's stop this division of dividing ourselves against everybody else just because the news or the CDC or some other doctor had something new to say. Let's stop that mess and go forward by faith and live this life by faith and know that God's got us all the way through this. You say you're pandering to your people. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I know what I get. I know what I hear. I know what I receive. And I know I want to be careful. But I'm not going to tell everybody else how to live their lives. If we are vulnerable, please hear, Pastor. If we need to go back to some social distancing, we will. We're watching the numbers. We will. I'm not opposed to talking about it, but don't come with presuppositions that you're going to box me in and box the church in because of your strong presuppositions. You've got your opinion and others have theirs, but we need to go forward in unity. My unity with you is Christ, not how you view your mask, not the type of mask you wear, not whether or not you believe somebody's vax can kill somebody else. 
That's not what our unity is based on. Do you understand our unity is Jesus Christ who lives in me and lives in you. Nobody wants to see anybody die. Nobody wants to see anybody hurt. Nobody wants to see that. So you hold your positions and I'll hold mine and we'll work at this together. But I'm done being divided. And if you've got to be divided, you're going to find something else to be divided over anyway. If that divides the body of Christ, you're going to find something to be divided about. It's just too easy to be divided. We've been through this. If anybody, I don't claim to be a doctor, but if anybody's a, an expert at dealing with getting hit between the eyes with this mess, we have. But I refuse to lead this church or lead in this community in fear. That is not of God. I will not do it. And I'm not going to impose my views on people just because I have somebody or myself because I get vulnerable. I'm not going to impose it on anybody else. I'm going to do my best to fix it in my personal life. Does that make sense? Are we okay? If I'm not, I still love you. I'll also tell you that I know the virus is real. I'm not stupid. My family's had it. We've had it. I respect that, but I also tell you that I refuse to bow to all of the fear-mongering. If you're a fearful person, stop putting that on everybody else. Amen. Stop it. If you're vulnerable, wear a mask, be smart, and stop judging everybody else. I respect every person for their conclusions, but let's stop the drama. That's what I don't like. I love you. I'm trying to pastor. I'm trying my best to pastor. Remember God's faithfulness. Here's the point. The same God that brought this nation through pandemics in the past is the same God that's going to bring us through the pandemic in the present. The same God that's brought the world through crisis in the past is the same God that'll bring us through the crisis in the present. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're not all going to hell in a handbasket. I don't mean to be facetious either, but our theology on heaven really gets, gets me in all of this mess. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I actually like Debbie's position on this. She's reminding me of this all the time. Now, some of you are going to call it careless. Debbie said, if we die, we know where we're going. We're just passing through this place anyway. Let all the hell rage. I know where I'm, what I don't want to do. Well, I don't either. I like life, but if I go, I know where I'm going. I'm not going out in fear. I'm going knowing that I've got something waiting on me that is indescribable, unimaginable, unthinkable. It is an incredible place that I'm on my way to. I'm passing through. That's what it ought to be about. <laughs> Fourthly, I've got to move on quick. I will rest and wait. Verse 16e, that I might rest in the day of trouble. Can you rest today? Pastor, I can't rest after what you just said. Well, <laughs> when he comes up to the people, the Bible says here he's going to invade them with troops. But Habakkuk said, as that's going on, when we're getting invaded and we're getting beat down, I will rest in the day of trouble. I will rest. Um... We're reminded of verse 3 of chapter 2, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but it will end. How can you rest in the day of trouble? Because you know there's an end coming. You know there's an end coming. I mean, if we all get taken out, there's an end coming. Boy, some of you don't like this preaching. But if we all get taken out, do you know where you're going? Maybe you need to back up and understand that you're going somewhere a lot better than this place. There's no more pandemics. There's no news media on all sides to stir you up and try to divide you politically. There's none of that mess. You're going to have to turn on your TV. You can turn on a ball game without it being politicized. Boy, I'm waxing warm today. I don't know what's gotten into me. Lord, help me. <laughs> you can do all of that, but you can rest. You can rest. You can rest in his promises. You know where you're going. This vision is for an appointed time. Though it tarries, it's going to happen. It's not going to be good, he said. It will surely come. 
Isaiah 40, 31, we were on this last week. Get in a position to wait. They that wait upon the Lord, we touched on it last week. They, they that wait upon the Lord shall, 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 what? shall renew their strength. Now, how are you resting if you're running? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run, run and rest. Run, run, rest, run. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk. How are you going to walk and rest? Walk and not faint. Teach, 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 teach me, Lord, to wait. 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 It's called, like we talked about it last week, just a little bit, it's called actively waiting. The idea here, just as it was in the chapter last week that we read, chapter 2, it's back up here in chapter 3 again. He's talking about this whole idea of actively waiting. Notice the language here. For the vision is for an appointed time. So you just wait and do what you know you're supposed to do. Jeremiah 29 fits right into the same concept. Build houses, plant gardens, get married. But it's going to be 70 years. You've got a long time yet. Well, hallelujah. Wait. But I gotta do this, I gotta do that, I gotta wait. I've gotta fast more, I've gotta pray more, I've gotta do this, I've gotta wait. There's an appointed time. Um, I also said this last week the Lord wants to deliver us through most things, not from most things. How many of you have had a, well, how many would say this? In most battles I've had, it's taken a season for God to get me through it. Or did you get them instantaneously overnight? If all of your prayers have been instantaneous deliverances, I want to talk to you. <laughs> I need you up here in the altar for every service. We walk through most trials. The children of Israel had to walk 40 years and 40 40 years. Um, every, well, go back to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had to go through the fire. Most problems and crisis that we see in Scripture, Israel's battles, they went through things. We always seek instantaneous deliverance, and when it doesn't happen, we get that attitude. Because COVID has taken a year and a half or however long you want to put on it to, for us to work through. Whoa, what are you up to? God, what are you doing? Um, while you wait and wait and wait, um, wondering when it's all going to end, wondering when your marriage is going to get better, wondering when this loneliness will stop, wondering when your disappointments and setbacks will be turned around, wondering when your dreams will come true, while you're wondering, watching, and waiting, you need to hold on to the plan of perseverance. This isn't an instantaneous altar call when it will all be fixed. Hallelujah. Say amen. I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> you're not going to get discouraged and give up, but you're going to actively wait. While you wait for the right career, go to work tomorrow. While you're waiting for the right job, go get a job that'll pay you for now. Quit waiting on your dream job. That's good preaching, Pastor Kelvin. While you're waiting on some financial blessings and you don't have a job, take a job, get some finances coming in, wait on the Lord, and keep asking the Lord and praying and believing the Lord to help you to continue to climb the ladder you're looking to climb. Am I okay? I will rely on the Lord. Two more quick ones. Though the, fig, though the fig trees may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fall, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the old fold, I should say, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet will I rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Though no toilet paper be scarce. <laughs> though gasoline goes up. Though hand sanitizer can be scarce. Though someone is angry with me in a line because I have a mask or don't have a mask. 
I will rely on the Lord. Yeah. And that leads to the last consideration, which goes hand in hand. I'll take it a step further. I rejoice in the Lord. The stalls are empty. The fields are not producing any vegetables. The fruit trees are not producing any fruit. It doesn't change anything. Circumstances don't change the fact that God is my strength. All this going on around me, hear the news. Oh, pastor, oh, I've heard this. Did you hear the news? Did you see this video? Did you get this? This is the big one. If you get the big one, you'll get the revelation. I don't know about all that stuff. All I know is the Lord is my strength. All I know is that this church has to lean on the Lord. All I know is that the people of God need to lean on the Lord. All I know, I don't know where it's all going. I don't know where it'll all end, but I know one thing. The Lord's got it. He's not forsaken himself from me. He's not divested himself from you. He's got us. He walks with us and talks with us. He leads us beside still waters. He is still with me. He's on my right. He's on my left. He's behind me. He's in front of me. He is still the King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's got all this mess. The Lord is my strength. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and get this, get this, get this. I will rejoice. I will rejoice in the Lord. Not only do I know, how, how can I rejoice? Because I know the Lord's my strength. I can't rejoice if I'm depending on my own insight. I can't rejoice if I'm listening to Dr. Fauci. Everything changes. I can't rejoice if I have to listen to the next world idea. Everything changes. But I can rejoice because the Lord is my strength. I will rejoice whether it's good times. I'll rejoice whether it's bad times. I'll rejoice when I'm up and I'll rejoice when I'm down. I will just keep on rejoicing because that's what I'm supposed to do. Let me clear this up. Rejoicing has nothing to do with how you feel. That's happiness. I've said this through the years. Debbie can, I can have a great morning going. And she'll ask me to do something I don't want to do. And when I try to sidestep it, she tries to pin me and make sure it gets on my list of things to do. All that happy, happy I was feeling, it can leave. Don't feel so happy anymore. My schedule got disrupted. She don't understand what I have going today, that I've got important things to do. Don't feel so happy. If you rejoice only when you're happy, we need to learn that in our worship experience. Some of you come in and the only time you rejoice if you're happy. Sometimes we rejoice only when we feel good and somebody's told us 10 good things. But we're told to rejoice. Paul put it this way. He picked up on it. He says, I'll rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will rejoice. These verses represent one of the greatest confessions of faith found in all the Bible. In spite of my unanswered questions, in spite of my unheard prayers, in spite of my unseen responses, in spite of my unfair conclusions, I will rejoice in the Lord. In spite of the famine and failures, in spite of all of that, I will rejoice. Rejoice, And for you that th think you've got a real corner on faith, you can't admit that there's nothing in the field. You can't admit that there's no cattle in the barns because that's a lack of faith. I think you're crazy. You don't need to lie to yourself. It's either there or it's not. You rejoice anyway. That's the greatest act of faith that could ever, ever be inside of you, that you could ever possess or ever, ever share, is that in spite of all of that, I'll still rejoice. If I go down, I go down rejoicing. If I go through the fire, I will. But if not, if I'm not delivered, I'll still rejoice. I'll still trust the Lord. I'm still going to walk with the Lord no matter what's going on in my life. Are you with me today? Would you stand with me?